It's a pleasure to be here. I've been asked to talk about longevity, and it's been great the last couple of days being around this meeting. A couple thoughts have occurred to me. One is, you know, this group seems awfully young to be all that excited about longevity, but uh, it seems pretty clear that CEOs of startups are probably aging more rapidly than the average person. So maybe this is exactly the group that needs to hear about longevity. The other thought I had is, um, you know, really maybe it should be Tom Brady back up here giving this talk. Um, that guy was amazing, and I think he clearly has figured out, you know, some approaches to reduce his biological aging compared to his chronological age. And if, if, if you don't really know what biological aging is, that's one of the things I hope to get across to you today. So I spent really about the last 20 years as an academic doing research on the biology of aging, and then about seven or eight months ago now, left my academic position at the University of Washington for a startup in the longevity and health span space called OptiSpan. And I'm just going to tell you just a little bit about OptiSpan during my talk, but um, my goal really throughout this whole, my whole career has been both to understand the biological mechanisms of aging and to try to get that information to as many people as possible to help us live as long and as healthy as, as we can. And that's really sort of the underlying mission um, at OptiSpan. So I want to start just with some level setting, get everybody on the same page about what I'm talking about. I think it's useful to appreciate sort of how we got where we are. Um, if you think about the approach of what I will call 20th century medicine to health, it's very reactive and it's very disease oriented. And while life expectancy has increased pretty dramatically in almost every developed nation over the last 50 to 100 years, um, it's a little bit less clear that health span, the period of life spent in good health, has increased. And in fact, I think you could make some pretty good arguments that health span may actually be decreasing in the United States right now. So what's clear is sick span has increased. We've done a really, really good job at keeping sick people alive. And obviously, that's important at the individual level. But at the population level, that creates some complications. Um, if you look at the state of our healthcare system, which I really would say is more of a reactive disease care system, it's really not sustainable. So estimates suggest that about 50% of Americans have at least one chronic disease. And age, aging, is the greatest risk factor for pretty much every major chronic disease. And about 90% of healthcare dollars are spent on chronic disease. And that number's increasing. And I think it's safe to say that's not sustainable. I don't know where it breaks, if it's 92, 94, 96, but it can't get to 100. So we need a change. And I think this is the sort of situation when a you know, really entrenched system is ripe for disruption, where there are lots of opportunities. And I think there are going to be lots of opportunities in the healthcare space to actually improve the way that healthcare is delivered. I mentioned that, you know, Traditional medicine, 21st century medicine, primary care is focused around individual diseases, usually in isolation. And it goes back before medicine. That's true in pharmaceutical drug development. It's true in biotechnology. It's true in basic research. We typically act in silos, trying to study individual diseases in isolation. And we typically try to treat those diseases. And the consequence is we do a pretty good job of treating those diseases and keep people alive with those diseases. But one of the implications here is that we're maybe missing sort of the thing that connects all of these diseases. And I would argue it's pretty clear that that thing that connects all of these diseases, and these are most of the major causes of death and disability in developed countries, the thing that connects those things is aging. And that there is a biology of aging, and that's something we can study and understand. And if we can understand it well enough, we can actually target that biology in, way, in a way that should delay the onset and progression of many, maybe all of these functional declines and diseases simultaneously. And so this is where I hope and expect 21st century medicine will go. And for the rest of my talk, I'm going to hopefully um, give you some reasons to be optimistic about that. But this is really the take home message, right? There is a better way. And I think targeting the biology of aging has to be a part of that better way for healthcare going forward. OK. So the first point I want to make is that we've actually made a lot of progress in the field at understanding the biology of aging in the last two decades. This graphic here is a graphic uh, called the hallmarks of aging. Some of you have probably heard of this. The hallmarks of aging, I'm not going to get into what they are. Happy to talk about that in the discussion period if people are interested. But it's useful to understand that these hallmarks of aging are 
the biological mechanisms that underlie the aging process. And there are 12 of them, and they seem to be the same across every animal. So it's true in people, it's true in dogs, it's true in cats, it's true in mice, it's true in cows. Look across the animal kingdom. These are highly evolutionarily conserved mechanisms of aging. And again, the point I want to make is, we understand this enough that we can actually give names to this, we can study the biology. In principle, targeting any of these hallmarks individually will have an impact on the biology of aging. And I think the really cool thing is there's a network that underlies these hallmarks, and there are nodes in that network that we can target that seem to modulate the biology of aging sort of overall um, to, again, delay functional declines in diseases. And that's really exciting. So we have some interventions which we'll probably talk about. So I'd say the biology of aging is being solved. But I do want to, again, set some realistic expectations, because if any of you sort of have peruse the sort of longevity community, you may be misled into thinking that we're close to solving aging, or we're close to this thing called longevity escape velocity, or Im immortality for billionaires. That's not true. So anybody who says that, you can immediately ignore those people, because they don't know what they're talking about, or they are lying to you. It's one of those two things. I would actually say, and I know this upsets people in the field when I do this a little bit, we're kind of closer to where humanity was in our understanding of the uh, face of the Earth in 500 BC. So this is a map of the known world in 500 BC, there's this sort of vaguely Europe-shaped thing. There's a Asia that doesn't look at all like Asia and an oversized Libya. And if you sail too far, you fall off the edge, right? So there's two things I want to say about this. Um, actually, we probably understand aging a little bit better than this, but maybe not a lot. Two things I want to say about this, though. Um, one is, there's a lot more to learn than we already know. And two, and this is important, this map was pretty darn useful in 500 BC, right? People used this map to trade, to make money, to move around, to explore the unknown. And so I think we know enough about the biology of aging that it's useful today, but there's a lot more to learn, and, and we really also need to be focusing on what we don't know. Um, OK, so I do want to take just a second to talk about biological age. In case that's not clear to everybody, what I mean when I say biological age as opposed to chronological age. Chronological age, passage of time, how old you are, no ambiguity, very easy to understand. Biological age is sort of the, the change in the function physiologically of your cells and tissues and organs um, due to the biology of aging, the mechanisms, the hallmarks of aging. And one way to really appreciate this, I think everybody can get, is to just think about dogs, right? We all learn from sort of an early age that one human year is about seven dog years. Now, obviously, that's not true for chronological time. What we're referring to is biological aging rate. Dogs age about seven times faster than people do. But it's not linear. And so this is a graphic um, showing one measure of biological age called epigenetic age. If any of you have heard of these biological age tests that are available to consumers, they're measuring epigenetic age. That's only one piece of biological aging. But if you measure the epigenetic age of dogs compared to humans, what you see is it's a nonlinear relationship. So, and this is true if you go to your vet and you see the chart that they have up there of dog years and human years, also nonlinear, just like this. Dogs are aging maybe 15 times faster than people biologically when they're young until they reach sexual maturation. And then it kind of tails off and it's maybe like three years to one year later in life. So we can actually start to measure biological age in meaningful ways that reflect what we see visually or, in, or what we see in terms of functional changes or disease measures. And one of the things that I started about 10 years ago is a large study of aging in pet dogs living with their owners called the Dog Aging Project. If any of you are dog people, I'd encourage you to consider joining the Dog Aging Project. It's a nonprofit, purely academic project, really trying to understand the mechanisms of aging in pet dogs with the goal of extending health span and lifespan in pet dogs and learning about the biology of aging in people. We've got about almost 50,000 people and dogs in the study now. We also have one clinical trial of a drug called rapamycin. It's really the first clinical trial for the biology of aging with lifespan as the endpoint in a healthy population to really test does rapamycin slow aging, increase lifespan, improve health span in pet dogs. That's called triad, test of rapamycin in aging dogs. OK, so now. I'm going to shift gears and talk a little bit more about where we're at in terms of human uh, longevity and health span and maybe some of the things we can do now. So my new company, OptiSpan, which I'm not raising money for, so I'm not going to, not going to pitch you guys on OptiSpan. Um, but our goal is really, you know, I mean, it's ambitious. Uh, our goal is really to help people achieve their optimal health span. So optimal health span, OptiSpan. Optimal health spans for everyone. 
and do that by creating tools that will enable doctors, nurse practitioners, providers to bring this sort of care to as many people as possible. And one of the things I want to illustrate, so that orange piece there is the curve I showed you originally, right? Six span has extended in, in America. Um, I actually think today we've got a pretty good opportunity to what we call square the curve, to make it so that health is pretty good, pretty far out until towards the end of life. And that's really what the green shading is showing, this recapturing the lost decade is what we call it, helping people maintain their health for as long as possible. Obviously, this is an idealized curve, right? I'm not realistically saying we're going to get everybody out to 80 years and then they're all going to die the next day. But I think we can get closer to that. And it's probably not as hard as a lot of people think. So some of it's obvious, right? Lifestyle is important. Like it or not, that's a fact. I think preventative diagnostics is a place where almost everybody is falling down. I would guess that probably almost nobody in this room has done the preventative diagnostics that will optimally prepare you for your future health, your future health span trajectory. I would also say there's a place for these generation one geroscience interventions, and we may talk more about that in the discussion period. Things like rapamycin potentially that can really help to get us that last little increment of, of health span. But I think this is doable and I'm very excited to, to be in a space and have the opportunity to, um, to, to hopefully help make this a reality. Then I think the interesting question is, can we do better? Can we actually, through studying the biology of aging, push lifespan out closer to something which is close to what we think right now without intervention is the species maximum, about 120 years? Um, and this is getting to where we would now have to go off that map that I showed you, right? The map of known biology of aging to get out to this, this, this area. Um, I think it's possible. I don't know how hard it's going to be. Another company which we spun out of my lab when I was at the University of Washington called Aura Biomedical that's actually what they're working on. So this is a technology to explore the unknown. And Aura has a technology um, that I think can, can, can measure longevity interventions uh, at about two to three orders of magnitude faster than what's currently possible in the rest of the field. So Aura started this thing called the Million Molecule Challenge. And the idea there is to test a million interventions for their effect on longevity to really try to explore the dark matter and figure out what don't we know about the biology of aging. So if you're interested, there's a video on YouTube. If you just look up Million Molecule Challenge, I'm sure you can find it. This is a community project where anybody in the community can help participate to create this open access data set, which I think really has the opportunity to change the landscape um, in the field. Okay, so then the last slide, what should you do now, right? This is probably what everybody's most, uh, most interested in. And we can dive a little bit deeper. Um, I think the most important thing obviously should be you've got to invest in your health like it's your most important asset. Almost nobody does this. But if you really sit back and think about it, if you don't have your health, nothing else in life is as good. So I would suggest that this is something that, that every, even if, you're, even if you're in your 20s, you should probably start thinking about this. And if you're in your 40s or 50s, you really should start thinking about this. Um, so rule number one, don't die. Okay, necessary but not sufficient if you want to maximize health span. Um, but when we get beyond that, right, you know, first of all, how do you not die? Okay, risky behaviors are obvious. This, again, I think is where some of the preventative diagnostics come into play. And they're not super expensive. You don't need this super complicated, you know, protocol with 50 different supplements. Um, I think there's a relatively small number of things that you can do to get you most of the way there. But if you're sick, if you've got a problem, you want to know about it as early as possible. And part of that is preventative diagnostics. Also, part of it is knowing your genetics. What are you at highest risk for, okay? Genetics can't tell you everything. Environment is super important, obviously, but there's no reason not to have that information. Um, here's the hard one. How do you find a good doc? So again, most docs haven't picked up on this yet. Most docs are still in the reactive disease care mode. I don't have a great answer for you other than to say one of the things we're doing at OptiSpan is collecting a network or creating a network of doctors, nurse practitioners who want to do this kind of medicine. And, and then as we create that network, we can actually help them know what to do, what are the right protocols, diagnostics, how do you interpret the data, and then also point, point people to those individuals. Um, I think that for now, looking for a doc that's preventative care rather than repair shop makes a lot of sense. A doc who at least has started thinking about this space. I wish I could give you a, a, a name. I know at least one person is out there. They want to, you want to ask me, who can I go to? I, I'm sorry, I don't have that for you yet, but we'll get there. 
Um, I said lifestyle matters, obviously. Everybody's got their pillars. Um, our pillars at OptiSpan, we have four of them, eat, move, sleep, connect. I think that's pretty obvious what we're talking about. But again, happy to dive into that if people want to. Last thing I'd say is, again, this is part of investing in your health. Money is important, but actually taking some time to educate yourself is important as well. There is a lot of noise in this field, unfortunately. There are a lot of people out there looking to make a buck being dishonest. And so I would say you need to be a little bit you need to be a lot skeptical, um, and you need to do your own research. And, and unfortunately, there aren't a ton of credible voices that I can point you towards. I hope I'm one. I try to be. Um, we will be creating a YouTube channel, an OptiSpan YouTube channel, if you're interested, where we're going to try to actually take a sober, realistic look at the space and inform people. Uh, among the sort of most popular influencers out there, I would say Peter Atia is the one person I would point you to who's very credible in this space, very realistic. Unfortunately, there aren't a lot more. So I think you've got to do some, some digging on your own and try to line up, you know, where does this seem real? Where does it seem like it might not be real? Um, and just be aware again, be a little bit skeptical. I think I'm sort of surprised how often people, really smart people, listen to some guy talking about his protocol, who has no experience in this space, and they're like, oh yeah, that guy's got it. No, you really need to be skeptical when you look at a lot of the noise that's out there. So I'll stop talking, uh, and I'm happy, I think we'll have a chance to take some questions. So hopefully that's been useful, and uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs>